Hello, and welcome to Christ Community Church Online. My name is Jenna, and I'm so glad that you could tune in with us today. We would love to connect with you, so we invite you to go to the link in the description and fill out our Connect card online. Our vision here at Christ Community Church is to encounter, pursue, and live like Jesus. Our prayer for you today is that no matter what day of the week it is, or where you're watching this message from, that you truly encounter Him. So let's get started. Father, we invite you, we welcome you. We know that your presence is not something we can manufacture or make. Uh, it's just something we welcome into the room. It, your presence, we want to host you, welcome you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being faithful. We receive from your faithfulness, not our earning, not our perfection, not our trying and striving. But Lord, this, this morning we receive from your free giving your generosity, your faithfulness, and your love for us. Thank you for everything you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, character development is really, really, really important in every story. And if you've ever read a really good book or watched a really good movie or a mini series or something like that, you know that um, the authors or the directors, they do a really good job of developing their characters in the story so that these characters become people that we agonize over when they fail or that we celebrate with when they succeed or, or that we miss them when the book or the show ends. You ever have that experience uh, where you get to the end of, of a book or a show uh, and you've, you've been spending so much time in the book or in the show that you feel like your best friend just moved away? You're like, I miss these characters. I miss, you know, Anne of Green Gables, come back. Come back to me. I've, I've never said that in my entire life, but maybe you have. Maybe you have, if that's a story that you love. You know, a good writer creates fictional characters with depth. And one of the ways that they produce that depth as an author is they employ character development through obstacles and conflict. <laughs> See, without conflict, there's no great story. Because without conflict... There's no urgency for the plot, and so there's no risk or change or maturity or depth for the character to go through anything. And in simple terms, you could say without conflict, you just don't care about the story. <laughs> right? I kind of joked in, in week one, uh, any story that begins with um, everything they asked for they got, and everything went easy for them, and they lived happily ever after. It's probably not a story that you'd be interested to continue reading, right? Um, but our stories, the characters we love, uh, the depth and, and maturity of these characters comes through struggle and through conflict. So in fiction writing, character development is the process of creating depth and characters through struggle and conflict. Well, how many of you know this morning that in spiritual growth, character development is God's process of creating depth and maturity in the mind and spirit of a person he loves. And it's usually also through struggle and conflict. Anybody ever go through a struggle? <laughs> Anybody going through a conflict right now? How about this? Anybody ever go through something that was hard, but you know you were better on the other side of it? It brought out something in you you didn't know was there. It showed you a side of God's nature, character, and love that you hadn't experienced before. I think we got a room uh, pretty full of, of people just like that. See, every good author develops their characters through conflict, and God, the author of our faith and our story, develops strong character in us, and sometimes he uses conflict for that as well. So as we continue in this series and talking about the next chapter, uh, you know, the next chapter is all about the story that God's been writing. And just as, as Mike shared, uh, this story has many wonderful previous chapters with many really cool and amazing characters. And, and a few of them are going to join me in just a minute up on stage here. But um, through this series, we are looking back, yes, and we are also looking ahead because we believe God is adding some really important new pages to our story. And so I want to share a message with you today that I'm calling character development. Character development. See, one of the best ways that an author develops the characters in his story is through conflict. We've been talking about that already a little bit. But there are different kinds of conflict. I don't know if you've ever thought about this when you're reading a good book or watching a good movie or something. Um, that there are different ways that an author may choose to test their character. So they might test a strong character, for example, 
by putting them in a trial that reveals uh, their weakness instead of their strength. You know, picture like a big, strong, like Dwayne Johnson, right? Uh, who has obvious physical strength in certain ways, um, but in the plot of a certain story or movie, he might play a role where he's got to become a nanny of three young girls. And he's got, you know, an obvious, plenty of, of physical obvious strength, but does he have the kind of emotional strength needed in the story, right? You can test a character that way. You can test the character with external conflict, you know, like something as simple as a bad guy doing a bad thing to a person that your main character loves. You know, that's external conflict that we've got to fight and battle and overcome. It's the why, right, of the story is the conflict. Or an internal struggle when you have to uh, put the character in a situation where they might act against something they would normally do or when they have to choose between two values that they have. Like when Spider-Man is forced to choose between saving MJ, the woman that he loves, or saving the bus full of school kids that are hanging off the bridge, right? You, you create conflict and tension, and tension is used to move the story and the characters forward, to make decisions. You create urgency, you create need, motivation, and why. Otherwise, there's no urgency, there's no motivation, there's no why in the story. Otherwise, why should they risk their lives by going into battle, right? Why would hobbits leave their little holes and go into this, you know, amazing story, right? If not for conflict and urgency that causes them to move outside of their comfort. Why should they go into the dark and scary house <laughs> without something that needs to be overcome? Or why should they face their fears, do something really uncomfortable? Because there's something to overcome, yes, and because of who they will become on the other side of it. Well, guess what? Conflict is a great tool for spiritual character development as well. And I wonder how many of us have some conflict going on, have some tension in our lives, and you're kind of wrestling over, where is this coming from? What did I do wrong? You know, th sometimes when we get into a situation of conflict or tension, we ask really bad questions. <laughs> and we need someone else maybe to come along and help you. And I know there are so many great uh, and wonderful friendships and, and mentoring relationships in our church. And, and maybe even some mentoring leaders that you have outside of the church that you can, you can go to and ask when you're feeling a little bit conflicted. And, and they can give you good advice, and they can give you tough love, and they can say, you know what I think? <laughs> I think you prayed for this, didn't you, six months ago or a year ago? You asked God for greater patience, and God gave you the opportunity to be more patient, right? <laughs> Anybody ever see Bruce Almighty? Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, what's great is we're never alone in that. And when you open up the pages of Scripture, like we're going to over the next couple of moments together, you can read about a lot of characters. And I would propose to you this morning, there's not a single biblical character that you love and care about that did not go through something that you would hate going through. Right? Because we're singing, you know, this morning, uh, I'm calling on the God of Abraham. I'm calling on the God of Moses. I'm calling on the God of David. I'm calling, right? I'm calling on all these stories that we've, many of us read about or heard about since we were children. But how many of you would actually want to stand in front of a giant who's a champion of war with nothing but a sling? Show of hands. No, I'm just kidding. Don't actually do that. And when I open my Bible, I, I'm confronted by the fact that many of the stories that I read and I go, God, do that in my life. God, use me just like that. That I'm not exactly aware or prepared <laughs> with the fact that what I'm asking is for God to bring great conflict into my story. One of these characters we can read about is the artist, artist formerly known as Saul, I call him, but he's the Apostle Paul in our New Testament. And he is one of the greatest leaders in all of church history. And the man lived with incredible conflict in his life. And if you're not super familiar, let me give you like the highlight bullet points real quick. He radically, under the name of Saul, persecuted the church. As a Hebrew man in right standing with, with ambitions to become a Pharisee, a leader, and a respectable man in his community, he persecuted radically this 
this sect of Judaism that began to claim the resurrection of Jesus. This rabbi who had done some wild and crazy things, healed some people, said some things that were pretty offensive to the Pharisees. And he chose to inflict conflict under his leadership on the early believers in the church. Um, He personally oversaw violence towards Christians like you and me, including at least one case in scriptures we know of where he oversaw the execution of such a believer. Conflict was his life's work, you could say. But one day, he was confronted on the road to to Damascus, violently confronted by Jesus, not in in a harmful way, but in a way he could not avoid like a character in any good story where they came to a crossroads and I can't ignore what's going on and I can't ignore what just happened. I've got to go left or I've got to go right. I can't keep going the way I was going. And, and Saul was confronted by Jesus who said to him, why are you persecuting me? And in that moment, Saul realized, I'm not persecuting a group of people who believe something crazy about a person. I'm confronting a living, resurrected Jesus who is who these people say he is. And it confronted him. It brought conflict into what he had been living for all of his life up until this point. He would go on to become a leader, church planter, preacher, uh, a writer of much of your New Testament. And in that transition, how many of you know he didn't transition from a person of conflict towards the church to a person Uh, who just enjoyed a comfortable life the rest of his days. It actually brought even more conflict into his life when he decided to proclaim Jesus. And in 2 Corinthians 11, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it quickly. Uh, Paul, now renamed Paul the Apostle, is kind of running down his resume here. He's not bragging, I don't think, necessarily. He's just not afraid to talk about what he's gone through for the gospel. He said, I've been through imprisonments. I've been through beatings, many times near death. In fact, you can read in the Acts of the Apostles where Paul was thought to have been dead. And I don't know about you guys, I I tend to imagine biblical things in a comical way sometimes. It says that he was, that they threw stones at him and then they they dragged him out and they thought he was dead and then suddenly he just popped up. (laughs) And I just imagine him just kind of like beaten and, and dead and they're all just standing there like we would all be like, whoa. And then he just kind of like pops up, brushes himself off, and then just runs away and doesn't say anything, you know, just like something kind of comical like that. Five times he says he received the 40 lashes minus one or 39 lashes from the Jews. Three times he says, I was beaten with rods. Once I received stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day in the open sea. That sounds terrifying. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, from robbers, from my own people, from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers outside the city in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers, toil, hardship, sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold, without clothing. Not to mention, he says, that there's a daily pressure on me, my concern for the church. Can you believe that? He says, I've gone through all of these things and the why in my story, why I would suffer. Why, did you know that the term, the the word passion, what we have in our English language, passion, the the background, the, the etymology of that word actually comes from suffering. It's what you're willing to suffer for. Passion. He says, my burden, my passion, my why, the conflict of my story, the reason I'd go running into the burning building or running into battle and risk my life. It's my concern for the church. It's my concern that these new believers who've come to know Jesus like I have would have everything they need to grow in their faith. It's my concern that as they go through their own struggles, that they'd have encouragement from me, their spiritual father. That's why. I've gone through all of this. See, Paul's not a character in a story that someone wrote and thought, how am I going to develop depth depth in this guy? How am I going to create an agonizing in in the authors that, that they'll want to read more about his story? No, 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 no. This is just a dude in history who really lived in church history, in biblical history, 
And darn if he did not live an amazing story, didn't he? He's maybe one of the most persecuted leaders of the church and eventually would be martyred for his faith in Jesus. And in Romans 5, he's writing to a church that he's concerned greatly over, the, the church in Rome. And he says this, and by the Spirit of God, he's saying it to us this morning. We can rejoice when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us. Because he's given the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. Now you might read through the book of Romans on occasion. And you know, it's a favorite, I think, of, of many believers because Paul so clearly, so passionately declares our justification in Christ and, and the many benefits of being a believer. But how many of you have ever read Romans 5 when he says, rejoice when you encounter trials and realize he's speaking from the memory of his own shipwreck, of, of starving and not knowing where the next meal will come from, of being chased from city to city, people trying to stone him, people trying to silence him, people threatening his life, who on occasion grab hold of him and beat him to the point that it's illegal to beat him any more than that in the hopes that he'll finally be quieted and stop doing what he's doing. But his great concern for the church, his conviction over the man Jesus who confronted him on the road to Damascus keeps pushing him forward, keeps causing him to risk it all, and he writes to the church in Rome, and he writes to us today, and he says, Rejoice when you encounter trials. Rejoice when there's conflict. Rejoice when there's tension. Rejoice when there's trouble. Because in the midst of that situation, you can depend on God and see the endurance that you need. The endurance that gives you a strength of character on the inside that produces a hope in you that you can get through whatever the next trial is that's coming. And that hope will not lead to disappointment because God loves us. And so in that love, we keep moving forward. It's for the same reason that you let your child struggle when they're trying to learn how to ride a bike. And you might even let them fall a little bit and and scuff up their knee or something, because you know on the other side of a few falls, they're going to get it right, and it's going to be this amazing rejoicing moment. <laughs> it's the same reason why you will ruin the butterfly if while the caterpillar is struggling in the cocoon, you go, well, let me just help him out a little bit and just, you know, cut a little hole here so that, no, it, the struggle produces the strength needed for what's next. It's the same reason why we heat metal to temper it and strengthen it. Under that intense heat, it becomes stronger to be more valuable and useful in the tool, you know, a tool in the hand of someone, a craftsman who can do something with it. Conflict, tension, problems, and trials, God's recipe for developing your character. <laughs> and we kicked off the next chapter a couple weeks ago, and so far it's been really fun to talk about. And as your pastor that's been the easy part. And the hard part is coming, right? And I just want to acknowledge there will be conflict, there will be tension, there will be problems, there will be trials ahead if we say yes to this journey together. Um, you know, it's so exciting and fun right now. The thought of a new building, the thought of new people joining our, our church family, uh, the thought of tearing down the barn, hallelujah, on the front row, right? Um, no more small bathrooms that don't vent well on Sunday morning, if you know what I mean. And uh, no more asbestos in the walls and no more steep stairs, all of those things. Um, but how many of you know new people coming to church means new people's problems? <laughs> how many of you know in order to get into a new space, there's going to be sacrifice and generosity on, on the part of everyone who's here right now? And there has been great sacrifice and generosity already for decades in this church family. There will be conflict, tension, problems. Today I'm going to ask all of our members to vote. And part of that vote has some language in there about potentially taking on a mortgage in our church family. 
And many of you know that our church has been wonderfully debt-free for uh, many, many years. And that's amazing. And the thought of the church taking on debt creates a little bit of conflict in you. Or, uh, you know, next week we'll, we'll start to talk about some of our financial goals. And I'll ask you to start to pray. Not this week, next week. See? So don't be mad at me this week. You can be mad next week. Some of the tension that's going to come into play. Because nobody here drove up in a Benz or a Tesla, or a whatever, I don't know what a status car would be of what I'm talking about, where, where you could easily write a check and say, here, build the building that, that you want to build. It's not going to be easy, it's going to be difficult for all of us. Or when unforeseen issues come up in construction, and we thought we were going to be open and meeting in there by this date, but something just happened in the supply chain, and now we've got to push it off a little bit, or somebody in the town on the planning board is not happy with us because of this or that, or you know what I mean? Or maybe on the road and on the journey while we're becoming the kind of people we're supposed to be, we have to make some tough decisions and maybe cancel that class or program or event or thing that you love that we always used to do, but we are headed in a new direction and a new chapter, and we honor that past and history, but we're not doing it anymore, and it hurts. Or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down the line, whatever else it may be conflict, tension, problems, trials, will you let those develop in you the kind of character God wants to develop, the depth and maturity that God is using these things as tools to bring the best out in you and in this church family? Samuel Chan uh, wrote this really interesting book. It's called Leadership Pain. I've got a quote uh, here on the screens for you. He said this, there is no growth without change. No change without loss, and no loss without pain. That's what we're talking about today when I say character development. Because every single one of us in seasons of life go through change or loss, but I wonder how many of us are able in that moment to say with faith, endurance, and hope, this is going to work out for my good. Because there is at least one Bible verse in your Bibles that says something along the lines of, all things work for the good of those who are called to his purpose, those who are loved by him, those who, Paul said in Romans 5, have the Holy Spirit and an awareness of God's great love for us. So conflict, tension, problems, trials, yes, they equal pain. And conflict, tension, problems, trials equal character, growth. Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, we've looked at this a little bit already, and it's kind of been a key verse for us. The writer of Hebrews is sort of giving a similar encouragement to the churches, the believers, those who are going through and encountering struggles and trials, and he says this, the way to run our race is with endurance and keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. He's authoring your faith story, and what a story it is. It's already been full of surprises, and maybe a little bit of tension here and there, and amazing victories, and highs and lows, and ups and downs, and back and forth, and how's this going to work out? And then it does at at the final moment work out, or it doesn't, and it causes hurt and pain, but you're still here, and you're still standing, and you're still moving forward, Even though you're hurting, you're a little different, you're a little deeper, you're a little more mature. Your character and your your endurance has developed a little more. You've gone through something you didn't know you could get through, and you're still standing, and you're able to look at whatever comes next and go, well, man, if I got through that, if my God got me through that faithfully, he can get me through anything. I believe God's adding pages to our story. He's developing the kind of character in you and in me and in us together so that we can step into the future and ministry that he has for us. And uh, I want to take the opportunity right now at this moment in my sermon to uh, invite up a few very meaningful uh, people to me, a a couple actually meaningful men of great character. Men who've been through a few conflicts a little bit of tension, some problems and trials along the way. Would you join me and stand and honor Pastor Bruce Plummer and Pastor Mark Dupre as they come?
Hey guys. <laughs> Go ahead and put that button up, yeah. Hey Bren. <laughs> um, I've got a little bit written about these guys. Um, because what's funny to me is I know the two of these guys are incredibly meaningful to many of you in the room. And there are a few of you who are like, who are these guys? Uh, because, you know, you just joined us this fall or just today is your first Sunday or just a few months ago was your first time here. And you're like, I think I've seen this, you know, really beautiful uh, white-haired man here um, a few times in church, but I haven't seen this guy. And and uh, let me give you a little bit of introduction just so everybody knows who these guys are. To my right, right here, Pastor Bruce Plummer. He served as the senior pastor from April 20th, 2002 until January 12th, 2020, when he handed things off to me. <laughs> he also served as the associate pastor for 16 years before that, 34 years total in pastoral ministry here in this church family. He's one of the most kind, gracious, and loving leaders that you will ever meet. He's wise and he's humble, just as the scriptures define both of those virtues. Um, pastor Mark here uh, had served as the associate pastor from 1998 to 2020, 22 years. He was also the film professor at RIT for 21 years. He's a cultured man <laughs> who's, who's lived in some pretty cool places on planet Earth. He's creative, he's musical, he's brilliant. Both of these guys are incredible husbands, fathers, grandfathers, and they're my friends. And today, in the midst of Pastoral Appreciation Month, I just want to honor and thank you guys as two of my pastors. I love you both. <laughs> so we're going to have a little bit of fun because um, I'm going to give these guys a chance to help us look back a little bit and then look forward too. Um, but we're going to look back on the good old days. Is that how, how they say it? Okay. Um, the old days, anyway. The old days, anyway. <laughs> and, um, and I want to start off, Pastor Bruce, uh, I'm going to give both of you guys a chance to answer this question. Pastor Bruce, what's one story, or, or maybe a couple stories, if, if uh, they're short enough here, um, that you love telling about the church in the, quote, old days? There are so many. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, with all those years... So, you know, you have to picture that our church started as a, a group of former college students who had no idea what they were doing, <laughs> all right? So, yeah, if you lived back then, yeah, yeah you know what I'm saying. So, uh, the Lord took us from rented property to eventually buy two and, uh, and change acres here, which just included uh, the barn. It was a lot of fun. And so when, uh, so when, we, when we got started, uh, there were all kinds of very interesting conditions to be found on a Sunday morning when you walked into church. For one, you walked up a ramp that used to be a ramp that Cadillacs would come up. This was a branch of Valley Cadillac at one time before our purchase. And uh, there was a ramp that now people walked up to get to, the, to, to church, but the, what was the showroom, so to speak, had a couple of cars in it at one time, became our, our sanctuary. It was, uh, it was well appointed, covered with, you know those carpet sample squares, you know? Yeah, the, it was, the floor <laughs> not, was covered with those. Not carpet tiles in the sense of matching, but carpet no. samples. Definitely not uh, matching. The didn't ones match, you take for free. But they were, but they were real carpet. <laughs> Sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> sort of. Yeah. So our first services here were, were, pretty, were pretty interesting because uh, there was a, a stage, not anywhere near like as nice as this one. There was a stage that was about that tall and, uh, and covered with carpet squares. Yeah. And so whoever, 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 whoever led worship, whoever preached, sat up, uh, stood or sat up there and, and, and did so. There was one bathroom in the entire church, and so as we were facing the stage, worshiping the Lord, the one bathroom was off on the left-hand side of the, of the sanctuary. So if anybody needed to use the bathroom, of course, first of all, they had to be desperate, and second of all, <laughs> second of all, they had to be very, very humble because everybody knew that they were going to the bathroom, everybody heard the toilet flush, and everyone, everyone saw them walk out. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> so it was like that, you know, but, but we, we, had, we had our humble beginnings, right? Yeah, it was pretty cool. The, we had no, I mean, there was no security system. There was no anything. So uh, at one point, interestingly enough, we had, uh, we had some robbers that, uh, that came in, in the night and stole uh, what few things we had of value, a couple of microphones and all of that. So, uh, so one of our jobs as elders in the beginning was, uh, was to take turns staying overnight at the church. So I remember, I remember uh, my, my good friend Gary Hodenius, if you know Gary and Mary, Gary uh, and I took our turn, slept on cots in there, and, and uh, Gary had his shotgun under the, un, don't tell anybody, tell, had his shotgun <laughs> underneath, the, uh, underneath the cot that he was sleeping in. Yeah, thankfully, no robbers came while we were there, but... Yeah. yeah, we got so, that. So you didn't have to shoot anyone. Didn't just have to, to be shoot clear, anyone. No one was then, shot that's, on the premises. That's, that's, of the that's church. correct. Okay. Exactly. That's no one was shot in the. Okay. And even in the telling of that story, no one was shot. Good. Um, probably my favorite story. Do you want me to get into how we acquired this property? Please. Yeah. So all right. So I told you we started with just 2.1 acres, I think, which is a pretty small amount of land. When you're talking about a growing church, of course, in the years in between, we added on the what is now the cafe in the back. And from those two metal posts right there back, that was an addition that we made to the, to the church. It was a great big thing that we took on and did. And then we added here, but we didn't have enough anywhere near enough parking spaces to be able to increase the size of the building or to do anything else that we wanted to do. So... The, the, the question became, well, Lord, do you want us to move or do you want us to stay here? But if you want us to stay here, you know, that property to the south, now this is that green area, that green space area to the south here. That didn't belong to us at the time. We, we, had, we, had to, we wanted to acquire it, we wanted to acquire some of it, but we were unable to do so. Uh, the folks who owned what is Barry Auto up here on Main Street owned, the Rexingers owned from Main Street all the way back to the school district, and they had plans for that property and wanted to keep it intact, so they were unwilling to sell us any portion of that. And over a period of about 10 years, we asked and were denied uh, any, any part of that as much as we would have liked to. So this building and property, we put it, we put it on the market. We put it for sale for a time, for about five months, uh, a long time ago. The elders and us, we, we, we went and looked at other properties. We actually prayed and fasted for three days over a property over on the east side of, of Brockport. It, it, was just, it was just not going anywhere. In those five months, no one came and, and, and even looked at, at the building here to purchase it, to purchase this property. So guess what we did? We prayed. And the Lord, the Lord kind of put it on our hearts to go back one more time to the Rexinger family and, and to ask them about purchasing part of this property to the south. So, again, Gary Hodinius and I went over, and we... we he didn't one, carry the shotgun this time. He though, did, right? ca okay. didn't have the shotgun this okay. time. No, we actually, we were, we were unarmed. <laughs> Good. <laughs> except for except for a sense of calling from the Lord. So we went over, and we talked to, we talked to Dave Rexinger's son, and he, uh, he said, well, you know, my dad usually is the one who makes these decisions and such. And so we sat down with the dad and talked to him about purchasing this property. He said, well, look, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I appreciate you asking, but basically the, answer is, basically the answer is no. So we came back here to church, prayed some more about it, and the following week, Gary actually called and followed up with, uh, with Dave Rexinger and said, you know, could we just meet with you again and just kind of close this up and, and, uh, and finalize your, your answer? And, oh, yeah. And so the first meeting was on a Friday. The next meeting was the next Friday. What happened in that week in between was nothing short of a miracle mm -hmm. because you remember in 2008 the stock market crashed. Do you remember that? And do you remember that, that many auto dealerships uh, had their dealership pulled mm -hmm. by, the, by the automakers? So this was Barry Dodge at one time. And in that week in between, it became not Barry Dodge. Mm -hmm. 
Dodge removed the dealership. And so in that week, between one Friday and the next Friday, Mr. Rexinger was cash needy and was willing to sell us this portion down here. You know what the Lord put on my heart? Just tell him the Lord has need of it. And you know, when that first Friday was there, I, I, I really kind of shyly said, the Lord has need of it regarding this property. And in that week in between, God did what only God could do. And the next week, he brought out maps and property, you know, surveys and such, and looked the property over with us and said, yeah, I would be willing to sell you this end. And the reason that we have all the acres and property that we have now to be able to even consider something that's larger is because God paved the way. Mm -hmm. It was a marvelous thing, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, so the question is, what's something that a story you love telling. Yeah, I love telling about the beginnings of all of this because I, I was away. I was away for ten years, but I was actually there before Bruce with everybody, all these college students. Um, Not that it's a competition, but no, no, but, but no. I'm older than Bruce. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, By so, a lot. Yeah, a, a, a year, a whole year. Um, so, but I'm younger than Mike Warren. Okay. So. Yeah. There all we right. go. So. Um, it was, competition. but just um, imagine 200 college students on a Friday night getting together to worship the Lord with all their hearts. Yeah. That's what began this place. And they were passionate and they'd go out and they would just evangelize like crazy afterwards. Uh, we had a whole bunch of wonderful teaching. I, I got saved around that time in 73. And uh, I remember going to the, teach, the wonderful anointed teacher that they had teaching us at the time. And I, I went to the first one and somebody said, well, what did you think? I said, I didn't understand a word he said. And I can't wait to go back next week. <laughs> yeah. So it was just, but imagine that many people crammed into a space all worshiping the Lord. I mean, who saw Jesus Revolution? Anybody see the movie Jesus Revolution? Diane and I walked out and said, everybody, all our kids and grandkids should see that so they know where we came from. So this church really came from that because what happened in California was a, a revival that came over here, made its way to the East Coast, and in a sense, our church leadership and all those college students were the sort of tail end of that particular revival movement. So I, I saw this movie called I Am Rochester, and I know that God can do it again. Um, what he did before as a revival, he can do it again. Yeah. And he wants us to be a part of that. So that, I just love telling that story because it's hard for people to imagine 200 college students coming together two years ago and, um, and worshiping, just like mad, like crazy. So worship has always been a big part of this church. Yeah. It's always been a huge, huge part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and the, the, the other story is, is that so many people don't know that churches in the area were started here. We a, started a church in Hamlin and in uh, North Chile and in Greece, you know, and even people who go to those churches have no idea their church came out of our church. But so we've always had a vision, uh, not only for salvation and, and the love of God, et cetera, et cetera, but also of reaching out because when so many people were coming from Greece, we just said, well, why, why don't we just start a church there? Mm -hmm. So many people starting from Hamlin, well, why don't we just start a church there? Mm -hmm. So it isn't about being the biggest and best church you can be. It's about ministering you know, right where you are. Mm -hmm. Yep, beautiful. Thank you, guys. So having lived through some previous chapters at the church here, what are some things that have always been true about CCC and always will be true in your mind? This is a special place. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you realize how special it is. And it's not just because, hey, everybody wants to come here. You know, you, uh, when, you, when, you, when you dream about places that you'd like to live, usually Brockport is not on your list. <laughs> just saying. But, you know, still to this day, one out of three people that I meet, and I, I meet people from all over now, one out of three people that I meet have some tie to this place whether it's ministry or went to college here or worked here or lived here or their parents lived here or somehow there's a, there's a tie to this place. And I think the thing, one of the things that is phenomenal about, about our call in this church and this area 
is that we stand at the doorway of people's futures mm. wow. in a very unique way, very interesting way. I used very unique. I'm sorry, Mark. I did. It's forgiven. <laughs> Forgive me. I'll explain that to you some other time. <laughs> you see, when we tried to sell this building, God wouldn't let us do it. He wouldn't let us move from this spot. And you know, I, the amazing thing to me is the calling of this particular church to remain at the doorway of people's futures. Wow. Now, yeah, there are some people that are, uh, all of you, have been called to be the core and the center of what God does here and will stay here maybe the rest of your lives. But we are located literally a stone throw from the, from the public school system here in Brockport. Thousands of students come through there every single year. We are a walking distance to the college at Brockport, over 7,000 students there. So we've often thought, you know what? We are, we are near, very geographically near people who are being developed and are being sent out to do who knows what in this world. And what if we change the trajectory of their lives yeah. by ministering the gospel to them, the word of God and prayer, ministering wow. that to them, and then sending them out to whatever God has them do? Mm -hmm. That, I think, is the unique calling of this church. I just want to make sure nobody takes it for granted, um, just to build on what you're saying, that this church is here. Churches are like restaurants. Most don't survive. Mm. That's just the most don't survive. I mean, one time somebody hoping to start a church came in to talk to me and Pastor Bruce, and very nice people. And they left, and we just said, they don't have a chance. It's, <laughs> it's never going to make it. It's just the anointing wasn't there. Mm. You know, they had good hearts, but... You could tell. It's like the fact that we are still here as a church, I, I wouldn't call it a miracle, but what it is is a sign that God has planted this church. Yeah. This is not just a church. This is a planting of God yeah. in this ground. So, you know, when people say, oh, I don't know, like that church or, you know, the, the consumer mentality that we have, this, is a church meeting my needs? You know, and, you know, I, I don't like the word. I didn't like the worship this week. Well, it wasn't for you anyway, you know. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it just, but it's God's heart is here. And if you can get a hold of the heart of God, then you'll understand why this church has been through so many things <laughs> that we've been through um, and, and survived, you know, and, and to, to talk about the impossible, I won't get into the specifics of it, but there's been a couple of occasions when I remember we had to get from point A to point B, and it was impossible. It was just impossible. It was never going to happen. We just looked, and it was like the promised land. You know, we, were, we have a situation, and it's unsolvable. Mm -hmm. And God solved it yeah. in ways that we could never figure out. Yeah. So he knows how to get us through. You know, and the fact that we're still here as a church and with a forward vision yeah. and a, a pastor with, with dark hair, <laughs> you know, just means for now. God has a plan <laughs> for the future because he's raised it up from the past. So is it safe to say then from what you just said, Pastor Mark, that the church has seen a few conflicts, trials, and changes. I had and dark hair before it all like started. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> so what have you guys, as, as pastors, as leaders, speaking as spiritual fathers today to many of us here in the church, through the church's history, this, this church specifically, what have you seen about change, transition, growth, conflict, trials, struggles, all those things, getting from point A to B, not knowing how it was going to happen, but seeing God move. What do you think that has uh, maybe taught you that you could encourage us with of how God uses conflict in our stories? For one thing, Pastor Brad brought it up a little earlier. Romans 8, 28 is a powerful mm -hmm. pivot landmark that you need to hang on to. Yeah. For we know that God works all things together for good to them that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. Yeah. Listen. 
This is bigger than humans. Yeah. Amen. You know that, right? This is bigger than, than people, even determined people, even nice people. It's bigger than that. This church is, this, this church, if you read Revelation, you see a picture of it. It's a, it's a lampstand. Yeah. And guess who walks among the lampstands? Yeah, Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ himself. Mm -hmm. this, is about, this is about God. Yeah. This is about the Lord Jesus, who is the head of the church. And yes, it's about people, and we have conflicts because we deal with people. But that said, God has gotten us through every single challenge, every single one. And there's been heartbreaking stuff that's, that's come and gone and, and you know, didn't really quite know what to do with at various points. But God has always gotten us through because our dependence on Him yeah. is never in vain. Yeah. It's always, all, God will always carry us through, no matter how difficult the circumstance is, He'll always carry us through. So, returning again and again to Him and to faith in Him and to trust in Him, that's what, that's what gets us through the tri trials now and in the future. Yeah. yeah. Well said. You know, you, you referred to God as the author and finisher of our faith a, a few weeks ago, and, but He's the author and finisher here of this group thing called the church. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he began it. It's, it's his thing. I guess on a personal thing, the teacher in me wants to say, please do not let offenses have their way. Yeah. Work them through. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody who's been through stuff knows what I'm talking about. And it's painful and it's hard. And if you don't, it will kill you. Mm. So there will be offenses because we all have expectations that are going to be, you know, not met to our perfect satisfaction. You know, and there are hope in people that people just, I mean, Diane and I have talked about this. It's like, we've had four church splits in my personal life. You know, there's, and all the stuff that Bruce and I know it have gone through, there's no reason Diane and I should even be coming to church. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's just insane. But why? Because it's God's idea. He started it. Yeah. He knows what he's doing, you know, and I don't mean to embarrass you, but I listen to people like Rube who just said, why would I go anywhere else? This is my church. Yeah. What happens, happens. But this is my church. This is where God has put me. Or Diane Wasserbauer who says, you know, I come every Sunday knowing I'm going to hear from God in my life. Mm. I mean, she's actually incorporated the church experience into her personal walk experience. Yeah. You know, I love that. Mm. You know, and it's just, if God has done all that, and again, you'd have to be our age to have gone through all the junk. <laughs> but if God trusts us, if we've been through all that and we're still here and looking to the future, you know, I, I can't imagine what God's going to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yes, I, I love talking about the past, but I'm much more excited about where we're going. Mm -hmm. All right. I've got one more question for these guys. I want to ask you, church, to physically do something representative of your heart posture. Just lean, lean forward a little bit like this. You know how you lean forward when you're really listening? Okay. Guys, what's one thing? Now, uh, truly, uh, we, we met a uh, week and a half ago to go through some of this and just kind of like talk and be together and, and just so I could say, hey, these are the questions. But this question I said, don't answer right now. Pray, hear from the Lord, and share with the church on Sunday the answer to this question. So you ready? You leaning in? Yeah? Pastor Bruce, Pastor Mark, what do you see and or pray for for CCC in the days ahead? We're leaning in and we're listening. I am praying that you eat this book. I am praying that the Word of God dwells richly in you yes. in every possible way, yeah. in your personal life, in the church life, in everything you think, do, and say. Let God's Word dwell richly in your heart so and pray. There are two things that will guarantee, that will guarantee the future here. If you base all that you do, all that you say, on the Word of God, mm -hmm. and you are a people of prayer, yeah. let me just tell you something. History will look at this church and say, uh, uh, they changed, they changed society around them. Mm -hmm. Those two things are absolutely indispensable in your life 
and in the life of church, this church, any church, this church. Please, please, please hear me. Dig in. Mind the gold out of the scriptures. Mind the gold out of a life of prayer. When there's a prayer meeting in church, and this Wednesday is a good one, don't let the typical 10% or less of the church body come together and pray. It's not just for special people. It's for the entire church. Yeah, that's right. There needs to be, there needs to be people kneeling at this <laughs> altar, kneeling at their seats, seeking God, yeah. looking, asking touching base with the only one who can make anything really happen in the first place. So, yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, mine sounds contradictory. One is stand firm and move. When I say stand firm, I mean there's 150 about uh, 100, 150 one another's in the New Testament only. Mm. You can't live your life without other people. Mm. There, I mean, God, it just, what's the first commandment? And then he said, and the second is this. Yeah. You know, and it's like, hey, don't, don't forget, I, I don't see a difference, says the Lord, between this and this. Work this out. Just stay, stay together because the enemy loves divide and conquer. It's just that simple. So just stay together. And the other thing is let God change you. You know, I mean, we, we, we think the goal is being comfortable hmm. and, and that everything is in its place. You know, God forbid that that would happen in any of our lives because he's always changing. He's perfect. We're not. And how can he put new wine into old wineskins and hope it works? Wow. Which means he has to turn us continually into new wineskins. Are we willing to do that? Mm. You know, so that, that's my prayer is that we'd be willing to let God do all that because I firmly believe that when we're positioned that uh, anointing from 50 years ago is going to be refreshed and re-energized and poured into us when we're ready to receive it. Wonderful, wonderful. Hmm. You guys stand and help me honor these guys as they head back to their seat. Come on, show them some love. Make some noise. Church, you, you can remain standing. We're going to be closing the service here. And uh, was that good? Yeah? Yeah. Let me ask you this. Was it really good? Yeah. It, was, it was really good, wasn't it, to hear from those guys? And in the context of where we are as a church, where you are personally, I hope you received richly from the Lord today.